Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's Mr. Parkin. I want to welcome you back to week three of our physical science lessons. Last week, we concluded um, standard seven, which we talked about motion, how to graph that motion. Um, this week, we're going to be talking about the forces that um, affect that motion. So let's just go to standard eight. Standard eight is on the board right now. Standard eight says, apply Newton's laws to predict the resulting motion of a system by constructing force diagrams that identify the external forces acting on the system, including friction. So we can take any object, whether it's a book sitting on a table, something being pushed across the floor, or even an accelerating car, and we can take all those forces that make it go into motion or make it sit still actually and we can put those into diagrams that explain why those objects have the motion like they do. So let's just um, talk about what we're going to do the next two weeks real quick. Today we're going to talk about Newton's first law of motion and Newton's second law of motion. We're, either, we're even going to talk a little bit about the law of universal gravitation. So. Before we can get into those force diagrams, or I like to call them free body diagrams, we have to know about Newton's laws. So today we're going to talk about Newton's first law, Newton's second law, and the law of universal gravitation. And then we're going to talk about a few of these key terms. So these key terms, you can go ahead and write them down if you want to. It's force, Newton, friction, and there's four types of friction we'll get to, a pound, kilogram, mass, weight, gravity, and wear. Um, next week, we're going to talk about um, Newton's third law of motion, and then we're going to talk about the free body diagrams, then we're going to put it all together in one and talk about three more key vocabularies. So, Newton's laws of motion. There are three of them, three laws of motion. The first law is when an object is at rest, like this tennis ball on the table, it's going to stay at rest unless we get put a force on it, okay? Or an object in motion will stay in motion unless it's acted upon by an unbalanced force. Um, second law is pretty simple. It says force equals mass times acceleration, or the net force of an object equals its total mass multiplied by its total acceleration. And three, which we'll get into next week, just states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. All right, I'm sure your grandmama's taught you about that, right? Um, the first law of motion. All right, that's where we're starting today. Now, I briefly said what it is, but I'm going to say it again. It's an object at rest will stay at rest, and an object in motion will stay in motion unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. Now the easiest thing to do is show you this tennis ball. It's going to stay still unless we push it, right? All right, there we go. It stayed still until I put a force on it. A force is any push or any pull. All right, any push or any pull. You might want to write that down. So this ball, unless I push it or pull it, is going to stay on this table. All right, what about this, though? I roll this ball across the table, and according to the law, it's going to stay in motion unless it's acted on by an unbalanced force. However, it stopped. All right, so that ball was the unbalanced force that time. So the first time it stopped, and the second time it went in the sink. Um, this law is also called the law of inertia. The law of inertia. Inertia is the tendency of an object to resist changes in its velocity. So even though this ball is going to slow down and eventually stop, the whole time it's resisting changes. Now it's easy to see this resisting changes in motion. The ball stopped. It's easy for it not to move, right, unless we push it. Another way of remembering inertia is just mass in motion. 
mass in motion. This steel marble has a mass probably three times this tennis ball. The mass is probably three times this tennis ball. They have an equal time, equal amount of easy time sitting on this table not moving. Which one would it be harder to get to move? Would they be equal because they're both round objects? Or would it take a little bit more to get the steel marble going? Now if you said it would take a little bit more to get the steel marble going, you're correct. Look at this. I barely even had to tap that ball. Same force, it's not really moving, all right? That is inertia for you. It's the tendency of an object to resist changes in motion. The more mass that an object has, the more inertia it has. That means the harder it is to resist changes in motion. All right, so <laughs> restating. Once this golf ball is airborne, it is um, going to keep going forever unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. Now look, unbalanced force is, is anything like gravity, air, or fluid friction. Do we experience gravity on Earth? Yes, we do. So that's why that may, might be one reason this ball stops. Do we experience friction? Yes, we do. And we're going to talk about friction a little bit more here in a minute. And again, unless this golf ball or unless this tennis ball is acted upon by an unbalanced force, a push or pull, then it's just going to sit on the tee or it's going to sit on this table forever. It's not going to move. Um, when objects on Earth, why do we observe everyday objects slowing down or speeding up without anything touching them. So if um, I roll this ball, why do we observe it slowing down and eventually come to a stop? There's a force between this ball and between this table that you don't see that's acting upon the ball. Does anyone know what that is? Now if you said friction, you would be correct. Friction is when two surfaces contact each other and rub together. That's basically what friction is. Now if you take your hands like this, you're creating friction in your hands. And by now you're going to feel something. My hands are getting warm. That means friction creates heat. So some of this energy in motion is turning into heat energy, thus it's slowing the object down. All right, there's four types of friction that you need to know. There is sliding friction. So if I took this beaker and I slid it across the table, it stops because of sliding friction. Sliding friction is going to be a little bit stronger than something like rolling friction. Rolling friction is something like wheels on the pavement or this ball rolling across the table. If you've ever gone rollerblading or roller skating at a skate rink, that is rolling friction. Um, fluid friction. I also want you to know what viscous is. I'm going to have to write that down for you. Um, fluid friction or viscous friction. That is when anything an object goes through a liquid um, such as water. Um, it can go through air, anything fluid like liquid or air, a gas, you know what I mean? So an airplane going through the air experiences fluid friction or viscous friction, all right? And then the last thing is called static friction. Static friction, again, is the friction that an object has to overcome to begin motion. This tennis ball is, is static right now. That means it's not in motion. It's not moving. To overcome this static motion, you have to overcome static friction. Okay. Now, static friction is a little tougher to overcome than it is for an object to stay in motion. Once 
you overcome static friction, it doesn't take a lot of force for that object to stay in motion. All right? Sliding friction, rolling friction, fluid or viscous friction, and then static friction. Now, <coughs> everyone has probably seen a car commercial and they have a test dummy. There's a, a, a test dummy to um, test the safety of vehicles. Now, they do this for a reason and they put a certain weight or certain mass in those test dummies. This is because they want to test how safe a car is on a certain body of mass because that body of mass is going to have inertia. If a car is going 80 miles per hour, did you know you may be sitting in that car not moving, but according to the ground, you are also moving 80 miles per hour. If that car that's going 80 miles per hour hits a wall like this one is, guess what? That car is going to stop but you are going to resist changes in motion. You are going to go 80 miles an hour forward. That's why seat belts are so important, okay? So everyone has seen a car commercial that has something like this in it, okay? And that's just showing that this human sitting in the car is maintaining the inertia that the car had that he was sitting in. Um, has anyone ever been in a car and the car go, takes a left turn and you swerve right, or the car goes right and you go left, that's also inertia because you're sitting in one spot going straight. And when that car goes to the right, it's gonna to wanna to keep you in the same spot. So you're gonna stay in the same spot relative to the ground. That's inertia, all right, mass in motion. The larger the mass, the harder it is to change that motion, okay? All right, that's Newton's first law in a nutshell. We're gonna to go to Newton's second law now. Newton's second law is force equals mass times acceleration. The net force of an object equals that object mass times the acceleration of that object. So again, this is just putting, showing you the words of what I said. The net force of an object is equal to the product of that object's mass and acceleration. You can also say F equals MA. F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration. So <coughs> we um, need to make sure that when we are doing this, that we are using an object's mass. We're not talking about an object's weight. Mass is the amount of matter that is found in an object. It's the amount of matter that is found in an object. And we measure it in kilograms, all right? We measure mass in kilograms. And acceleration, we should remember acceleration from last week and the week before. We measure that in meters per second squared. Now. If you're looking at the board right now, it's going to say meters per second per second. But meters per second squared is the same thing as meters per second per second. So one Newton is equal to the force required to accelerate one kilogram at one meter per second squared. Now, the reason I say that is one Newton equals one kilogram times one meters per second squared. One times one equals one. Okay, any time that you multiply a kilogram and meter per second squared, any time you multiply these together, they equal a Newton, okay? They equal a Newton. So, <coughs> let's just take this step by step real quick. Um, it says, how much force is needed to accelerate a 1,400 kilogram car two meters per second? So how much force is needed to accelerate a 1,400 kilogram car at two meters per second? 
So our formula is F equals M A. Or I taught you a little trick last time, two weeks ago. We have this little triangle. Oops, sorry about that. So this is your triangle. You have force equals mass times acceleration. All right, so that means if you want to find force, just cover up the force, and then you have mass times acceleration left. If you want to find mass, cover up that M, and you have force divided by acceleration. And if you want to find acceleration, just cover up the A, and you have force divided by mass. All right. So we have how much force is needed to accelerate a 1,400 kilogram car, two meters per second squared. So we wrote the formula, and now we're going to fill in our variables. So we're trying to find force. Our mass is 1,400 kilograms, and our desired acceleration is two meters per second squared. So now all you have to do to find force is multiply those two together. So you can either get a calculator, write it down, or you can say 14 times two is 28. Add your two zeros, and then it's gonna be Newtons. So the force needed to accelerate a 1,400 um, kilogram car at two meters per second is 2,800 newtons. Remember, a kilogram times a meter per second squared equals a newton. So, <clears throat> I'm gonna, I have this on the board right here, and it just says the net force in one column, the mass in kilograms in column two, and then the acceleration in meters per second squared in column three. Now, if you look, it's kind of set up the same way as the formula. Force equals mass times acceleration. So we have 10 equals two times five, because two times five is 10. We have 20 equals two times 10, because two times 10 equals 20. So how would we fill in this third row right here. 20 equals blank times five. So what we would do, now you can either go back to your triangle, you can either go back to your triangle, or you can just come over here and fill in the formula. So we have 20 newtons, equals m times 5 meters per second squared. Now, if your algebra skills are kind of leaving you at the moment, that's okay because you have a little trick you can do. Force equals mass times acceleration. So if I want to find the mass, just cover up the M, and we're left with force divided by acceleration. So we have 20 newtons divided by five meters per second squared equals four kilograms. All right, some of you, I know, some of you didn't need me to do all that. But the thing is, maybe one of you may have needed me to do that. So what we have here would be 20 equals 4 times 5. All right, so the other two, 10 equals 5 times what? 5 times 2 equals 10. All right, right here we have 10 equals 1 times 10. 10 equals 1 times 10. That's it. So... Newton's second law also tells us something else. We, we briefly talked about this um, last week. We said that two objects 
no matter the mass, this tennis ball has a higher mass than this ping pong ball, that they are going to fall to the earth at the same rate or acceleration. So no matter the mass, as long as they experience the same fluid friction, remember the friction going through the air, that these will hit the ground at the same time. And we just saw that. Now, again, this steel marble has a really high mass. It is probably five times, six times greater than this ping pong ball. I don't say that because I know it's a guesstimation. Everybody knows how light ping pong balls are. And if you heard that, that should tell you the mass of this ball. So you saw the tennis ball and the ping pong ball hit the ground at the same time. Well, these masses are a lot different and they still hit the table at the same time. Man, <clears throat> you'd think I'd be able to catch by now, you know? Um, so at different um, masses, if they experience the same fluid friction, they hit the ground at the same time. All right, Newton's second law tells us that. However, is it gonna hurt worse if this steel marble hits you in the head, or is it gonna hurt worse if that ping pong ball hits you in the head? It's really gonna hurt and probably leave a good knot if this steel marble hits you in the head because the force is so much greater. So bring your attention to this board right here. Now, if you look at the picture that is here, the illustration that is here, you see that this rock has a 10 kilogram mass and that this pebble has a one kilogram mass. They're both going to fall at 9.8 meters per second squared. However, they're going to have different forces. This boulder or this rock is going to have a 98 Newton force and this pebble is going to have a 9.8 Newton force. Okay? <coughs> so I also want to bring you your attention over this way. Now I talked about how they're going to fall at the same speed if they have the same fluid friction. Now, if anybody's ever been skydiving, you know that you fall at a different rate if you spread out or if you toothpick it. All right, if you toothpick it, that means you have a lot less fluid friction and you're going to go faster. If you spread out, you're going to fall at a slower rate, even though it's not going to be that big a difference okay you're still gonna fall at a slower rate spread out now what I have here are two pennies yes this is a penny this is a regular penny that you can spend in any store and this is a penny that has been flattened by a train all you have to do is go put a penny on a train track and this is your result this has a lot bigger surface area if I drop this penny it's gonna fall all right it, it fell to the bottom. Now, I expect this penny not to fall extremely slower, but just to fall a little slower. And it did fall slower. That's because the surface area of an object depend I mean, the friction of an object depends on the surface area of that object. The bigger the surface area, the larger amount of friction it's going to have. All right, so, um, <coughs> This is something that we're going to pick up on next week, and it's called universal gravitation. And it's going to take probably 30 seconds to do universal gravitation. Um, there's just a few definitions and key terms we didn't get to today, and, and that's okay because we have next week to do those as well. It's not going to be as, as packed with information next week. So next week we are going to... Um, pick up where we left off. Today we learned about Newton's first law of motion, Newton's second law of motion, and we're going to pick up next week on universal gravitation. We're going to talk about Newton's third law of motion and then how to draw some free body diagrams or force diagrams. But for now, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your week and we will see you next time.